Now hear the word of the Lord from Mark chapter 1, verse 40 through 45. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. Then Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. As a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus, and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in the secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Sojourn. Peace be with you. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Welcome. Uh, my name is Jonah. If you're a guest with us, I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, our mission as a church, what we're doing here is uh, we're trying to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the good news of who he is and what he's done for us. Build one another up as his church and send each other to follow him as instruments of truth, beauty, and goodness. I'm thankful that each of you are here this morning. It's been a bizarre morning. If you uh, follow us on any of our Facebook stuff, a, a squirrel got too curious on a power transformer this morning, and he cooked himself, um, killing our power and our microphones and our air conditioning. So uh, I had a funeral for the squirrel in the dumpster in between services. Rest in peace. Uh, let the reader understand. You know, that sometimes you get too curious and, <laughs> and you melt yourself. But I ain't going to let a little bit of heat and quiet microphone steal my joy, amen? Wow. It's kind of like what church was like for 1,970 years. And uh, now we're like, oh, the mics are out and whatever. Um, <laughs> Y'all sing so lovely. So uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting text this morning. Uh, just a few verses were read for us. But what happened? Oh, uh, so scary. <laughs> Y'all don't know. Yeah, y'all don't know what it's like hearing strange sounds when you're on the stage saying, thus saith the Lord. Uh, <laughs> good Lord, that's terrifying. Um, whew. Uh, yeah, so if you'd like to open a Bible to Mark chapter 1, if you brought one with you or there's one in the seat back in front of you, it might be helpful to follow along because uh, we're going through about 20, 25 verses this morning, um, looking at some interesting patterns. Uh, if you're opening it or while you're kind of settling into sermon time, uh, I want you to consider... Um, if you've ever experienced some form of the pain of, of being invisible, you know, where you feel like no one sees you, no one cares about you, uh, or if you've ever felt uh, unappreciated at work or at home, anybody got that one sometimes? If you're here with your spouse, don't answer, just answer in your spirit, right? Uh, maybe you do the same chore every day, day after day, and nobody notices and nobody seems to care. Uh, or you, it's like the group project syndrome where you feel like you're doing all the work at the group project and everybody gets the credit and nobody notices. Or you see your buddy who lies and shows up late, get the promotion. Um, maybe some of us feel a deep loneliness. Uh, it's that feeling like you wish you could just take what is inside of you and share it out with the world, but somehow you've learned that nobody cares what's really going on inside of you. You're convinced that no one sees you and no one cares you. You feel in, invisible. And maybe some of you know this feeling. I'm of the opinion that this kind of pain is universal. The longing to be seen, the longing to feel like we matter, I think it's universal regardless of culture, regardless of time of life or period, geography. Uh, but I do think our American culture has some relatively unique ways that we go about addressing it. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples that I, I think about. Does anybody know somebody who, between the ages of 35 and 40, quit their job to start a podcast about how to do the job they just quit? Have you seen that? Have you, have you seen how many 40-year-old people start a podcast? Do we really need another podcast? Um, have you noticed this new career that's becoming popular called social media influencer? What is that? It's where you get really popular on the internet telling people how they could live better 
whether that's physically, with their health, with their decorating at home. Um, well, why do so many of us pull such long hours at work? And maybe, maybe you've believed the lie about quality time over quantity time. That's where I'm going to work all these long hours, but we'll make up for it with a really great vacation. My, my kids are nine, eight, and four, and it's shocking to me how many of us already are investing thousands of dollars to travel all summer so that our eight and nine-year-olds can get better at soccer or baseball. And not everybody, but a lot of folks in our church are between the ages of 35 and 45, and we've got a lot of kids. And universally, they say things like, we're so busy and we're so exhausted. The church feels like we're in a competition for every event uh, because we're all so busy and so exhausted and yet we still feel so unseen and so lonely so we keep saying yes and doing more and doing more and doing more. For us, we Americans, we tend to think that the way to address our feelings of isolation and loneliness, our invisible lives, is to become impressive and important. The, the American ethos is kind of get more, do more, faster, bigger, and impress and be seen. And so most of us live lives that are screaming, maybe not with our words, but with our priorities and our commitments and our activities. Our lives are screaming, would someone please look at me? Unless you think this is just a problem out there, we do this in the church too. We come up with taglines and slogans to justify more, bigger, faster. We do the same thing that they're doing out there. We just say we're doing it for God. But how is that working for us? How's that working for you? If, if you've been coming with us through um, this series, Good News People, I promised you two weeks ago that Jesus would confuse and disorient us. And uh, this morning, I'm going to try hard to begin to keep my promise to you. When, when we, we Americans, think that we need to get more and do more, we tend to be drawn to information and strategies. So you have a problem in your life. Well, if you get the right coach, if you read the right book, if you develop the right family plan, if you develop the right strategic framework and implement it, then you'll be seen and you'll get the more that you're looking for. Uh, the Gospel of Mark, though, is not interested in giving us a new strategy. And it's really not interested in giving us more information. The Gospel of Mark is trying to show us who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Mark's not trying to tell us about Jesus as much as he's trying to show us who Jesus is. Because when we see Jesus, when, when we really see Jesus, you will see Jesus seeing you. And you'll see that he sees you and he wants to heal you. He sees you not because you've done more, but because of how helpless you are. And he wants to heal you, not because you're so impressive, but because of his great love for us. Uh, there, there will be information about Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, but most of it will be like what we see in the very beginning of this section, chapter 1, verse 21. Here's an example of how Mark think, handles the teaching ministry of Jesus. Uh, he says in verse 21, Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority. Those of us drawn to strategies and information have questions like, what did Jesus teach? And Mark says, that's not the point. It says he taught with authority, but we don't get anything about what Jesus actually taught. We get people were amazed and they thought Jesus had real authority, but we don't know what Jesus had to say. Because for Mark, it's Jesus himself, not Jesus' teachings, that are the most important information we need. Mark wants us to move towards Jesus, not towards his teaching. And so for the next 20 verses after this, we get pictures of what it means that Jesus sees us and wants to heal us. Mark is showing us something about Jesus. And so there's some real clear patterns. There's three stories that happen after this. And there's real clear patterns that I want to try to step back and help us see. Because again, Mark is trying emphatically to show us something that will, that will shape our imaginations and our understanding of who Jesus is and what he's up to. 
Uh, the first thing I want to notice is the kinds of people that Jesus was drawn to, the kinds of people that Jesus saw. So after finishing this teaching, this authoritative, incredible teaching, we meet a strange man. Verse 23. Suddenly a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So, a couple of things to notice here. It's an evil spirit in control of this man. Did you catch that? That's kind of the obvious part, which means that the man is not in control of himself, right? The evil spirit is telling this man what to do. This evil spirit is speaking for this man, which means the man has no say in this matter. Uh, did you notice the evil spirit is antagonistic and angry? He's upset with Jesus. Um, he's not curious about Jesus. He's not excited that Jesus is here. He's decidedly against Jesus. And he's not asking for help either. Did we all see that? Neither the man nor the evil spirit is asking Jesus for help. He calls him the Holy One of God out of disgust and fear. This is the antagonism. He's not, this isn't reverent. This isn't worship. So in the first story, after his authoritative teaching, Jesus sees someone antagonistic and angry, not interested in receiving help. Second, verse 30. Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. You ever had a fever so bad you couldn't get out of bed? We all been there, right? Uh, how productive are you when you have a high fever and you can't get out of bed? Is that your most productive work day? Is that your most efficient time? I mean, have you ever been so sick with a fever you can't, even, you can't even roll over to watch Netflix, your whole body aches, all you can do is curl up in a ball? You notice that this doesn't, in, if you think I'm skipping over verses, this isn't actually in every Bible. You can go read this in Mark chapter one yourself. You can open it in front of you right now. This woman doesn't say anything to Jesus. She doesn't promise him anything. She doesn't confess anything. She doesn't ask for anything. Jesus sees someone so debilitated by sickness who's not even asking for help. Third, verse 40, a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. In that part of the world during this time, a leper would have been considered socially and ritually unclean. I think all of us to some degree or another have been lonely before. Uh, and maybe some of us are plagued by loneliness and I don't wanna dismiss the pain of that. But as far as I know, none of us have been told by our religion and our society that we are supposed to live in permanent isolation, literally outside of town, living on your own. And I can't help but wonder, what do you think was worse, the physical pain of this disease, which was surely great, or the emotional relational pain of permanent isolation? We're learning more and more about what it means to be a human these days. And study after study is coming out with the just absolutely crippling effects of loneliness and isolation. It's one of the worst, has some of the worst physical effects of anything, diseases, habits, being lonely and isolated. And do you notice this guy's not asking for help, but he's desperately begging for it? He comes to the stranger and falls at his feet. We don't get the sense that he knows anything about Jesus other than maybe he's heard some stories. He knows enough to fall at Jesus' feet and beg for help. Jesus sees someone suffering and socially isolated, desperate, absolutely desperate for help. So notice the similarities. In each one of these three stories, there is incredible suffering and incredible helplessness. None of them, none of them were able to change their situations. Spiritually, physically, emotionally, socially, each of them in their own way was helpless to solve their problem. None of them knew much about Jesus. There's no evidence of deep faith here. One of them is antagonistic. One of them says nothing. The other, you, maybe someone's like, well, the, the leper looks like he has faith. The leper looks like he has desperation to me. He makes no grand confession. He doesn't say anything about Jesus. He falls at his feet begging for help. So what's Mark trying to do here? In these patterns of these kinds of people, he's putting their neediness out front so that he can put the power of Jesus out front. He's emphasizing Jesus' good news ministry 
not Jesus' teaching. Jesus sees the desperate. He sees the helpless. He sees the suffering. He sees the angry. He sees the antagonistic. And if he sees all of these kinds of people, even when they don't know anything about him, even when they're not asking anything of him, might he see you too? Jesus sees these people, and he wants to heal these people. And so now watch what he does to each one of these people, to the spiritually oppressed. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. What does it mean that Jesus has a real authority? It means he has authority over the unseen realm. Jesus has authority over spiritual darkness. He heals the spiritually oppressed and restores this man's soul. To the, to the bedridden with illness, verse 31, he went to her bedside, took her by the hand, and helped her to sit up. Then the fever left her. Not many of us like the word authority these days. Do you see how gentle the authority of Jesus is here? How different that is than what we think of as authority? What does authority look like for Jesus? He takes this woman by the hand, helpless and needy, and he helps her to sit up. He heals those bedridden with illness, restoring this woman's body. To the socially outcast with disease, verse 41, moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. Instantly the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. You see how compassionate the authority of Jesus can be? When was the last time this guy was touched? When was the last time this man felt the touch of another human? Jesus heals those socially outcast with disease, restoring them both socially and emotionally. He could have healed this man however he wanted. It's no coincidence that he heals somebody isolated this way with a physical touch. What does it mean that the kingdom of God is at hand as Jesus preached to us last week? This is what it means. What does it mean that Jesus has a good news ministry? It means that he has come to see you and heal you and to heal all that you are, all that makes you a human, physically, spiritually, socially. He sees you and he wants to heal you. Jesus' ministry is good news for those who are physically, socially, emotionally, and spiritually downtrodden. And so it may be a question for you to consider later this afternoon uh, to chew on. It's a simple question, but a profound and it's a dangerous question. How do you need to be healed? How do you long to be healed? Is it your isolation and loneliness? Is it a, maybe it's, physical pain. It feels like unending physical pain. Maybe it's disease. Maybe it's spiritual doctrine or spiritual darkness or oppression. How do you need to be healed? I, I really hope you can see that it was not faith or obedience or being impressive or productivity that made these people worthy of Jesus' attention. What made them worthy of Jesus' attention was their neediness and their helplessness. And so for us, maybe the way to get what we want is not in fact to do more or to be more or to impress more. I want you to know that whatever ails you, whatever you bring with you this morning, Jesus sees you. If you're here and you are angry with him, I want you to know Jesus sees you and he knows your pain. If you're here and you're sick, you feel unable to even speak a word to him, he sees you and he knows your pain. If you're lonely, if you're desperate, if you're at the end of your rope, he sees you and he knows your pain. I don't know what you came expecting this morning. Uh, the, the spiritually oppressed man, he was not expecting to meet Jesus that day. Simon's mother-in-law was not expecting to meet Jesus that day. That leper was not expecting to meet Jesus that day. I don't know what you're expecting this day, but I know each of us in our own way needs to meet Jesus today. 
We need to hear him say to each of us in our own ways, be clean, sit up. We need him to touch us and remind us that we are not alone. These stories are showing us what it means that God is near, what good news ministry looks like. And there's one more pattern in each of these stories that makes me think we might just be in the perfect spot to meet Jesus too. And if this doesn't confuse you, I just pay closer attention and wake up because this is not how we work. Huge crowds bring more demon-possessed people to Jesus. Why? Well, what do you do after you eat at a great restaurant? You put it on Instagram or Twitter or you call somebody and then the next day more people show up, right? If somebody you knew was demon-possessed and they were healed, you would tell other people about what happened. And so more demon-possessed people show up to Jesus. Verse 34, Jesus cast out many demons, but because the demons knew who he was, he did not allow them to speak. What would have happened if they spoke? They would say, Jesus is the Son of God. Doesn't that seem like the kind of thing that we think Jesus would want people to know? Jesus does not seem to be interested in more, bigger, faster. You will not find Jesus pursuing more, bigger, faster in any of the Gospels. After those healings, verse 35, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. What would you do if there was a line out the door for a service you were performing? Probably increase prices and put it on social media. Isn't that what we would do? Something must be going well. Healthy things grow. We've said that for years at Sojourn. Things are growing. Line is out the door. What does Jesus do? He goes out into the woods and prays. The disciples have to go on a manhunt for him. And they, assess, in essence, say, Jesus, look at all these people. Everything's working. Everyone's looking for you. There's a line out the door. Verse 38, we must go to other towns. This is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee. Jesus is not interested in building an impressive platform or larger crowds with a line out the door. Jesus isolates himself to pray and chooses to go somewhere else where he's less known. After healing the man with leprosy, Jesus warns this man, don't tell anyone about this. Go to the priest and let him examine you. Don't tell anyone. But the man didn't listen. Soon huge crowds surrounded Jesus. Verse 45 says he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere, so he spent his ministry living in secluded places camping out alone in the wilderness. This is what Jesus did with his growing fame. Verse 45, he had to stay out in the secluded places. What I want you to see is the peculiar, unexpected, confusing, downward mobility of Jesus of Nazareth. Downward mobility. The more popular Jesus became, the further he went into the woods. The more the important people wanted to be with him. Don't we just so badly want the important people to come? Don't we want the important people in our house? Don't we mark the successes of our lives by how influential we've become? But the more that the important people wanted to spend time with Jesus, the more he spent time with the diseased and the poor and the suffering. The peculiar downward mobility of Jesus of Nazareth. If you feel unimportant this morning, if you feel unimpressive this morning, if you feel unseen this morning, I want you to know those are Jesus' favorite people. Those are the people that he chooses to be with. If you feel yourself in the wilderness of life, uncertain where you are or what you're doing, uncertain of how it could have all come to this, I want you to know the wilderness happens to be Jesus' favorite place. There's all kinds of tensions here in this story, if you're paying a little bit of attention. And I'm not going to resolve any of them for you, uh, because Mark is not resolving them for us. I'll just say a couple of things. Maybe you're like, what tensions are you talking about? Well, just the fact that Jesus keeps saying, don't tell anybody what I'm up to. You want some more? Anybody want one more tension? Can I give you one to make everybody uncomfortable? Anybody? Yep. yep. What? Okay. A, me a mentor asked me this one time. So these diseased people get healed, right? 
We're Christians. We're supposed to be cooking all the time. All these needy people out there. The mission of God. Go, 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 go. You ever felt that? If you've been coming to our church, you felt that. I'll just tell you because we've been that church. Um, Jesus heals a leper. Diseased people come. And I had a, a spiritual father ask me one time. He said, what do you think it was like to be the next leper in line when Jesus said he was done healing for the day? Do you know how many people in these crowds were left unhealed? Some of you are angry this morning because you have yet to be healed. And that's a tension that Mark gives to us. And Jesus says, don't tell them who I am. Don't tell them what I've done. There will be resolution eventually, but not yet. And it's worthy of our reflection to sit and feel this discomfort. And maybe consider what is this revealing to us about the nature of God's mission. What is it that God is up to? What do these stories say to us about our desire to be seen? I want you to know that the longing to be seen or to feel like you have a significant life or that you're a consequential person is quite human. That's not bad and it's not wrong. But I think we have to wrestle with who is it that we want to be seen by? Who is it that we're trying to get to see us? It's not wrong to want to be seen, but might we be trying to get to places that Jesus is not interested in? I just want you to consider that maybe Jesus is not found on the impressive stage, and maybe Jesus is not found with the important people. Maybe Jesus is not found in the spotlight, but he's found in the secluded places. So this morning, if you feel your neediness, if you know that something ails you, then you have all that you need to meet Jesus. You have all that you need. So how do you need to be healed? However you answer that, the invitation is the same. Come to Jesus. Confess your neediness to him. Confess your anger to him, your desperation, but come to Jesus. Who do you know that needs to be healed? Who do you know that could use just a taste of good news? Well, guess who gets to go to them and share good news? You do. Just like Jesus came to you with good news. Jesus sees you. No matter where you are this morning, Jesus sees you and he wants to heal you. Amen. If you're willing and able, please stand with me and we'll pray.